must say that uh, though other days may not be so bright as we look towards the future, that the brightest days will continue to be those in which we visited you here in Ireland. Thank you. nineteen sixty three racial tension threatens to explode across the southern states of america the profumo scandal breaks in england the first woman in space is a russian cosmonaut and just as he promised cassius clay knocks out henry cooper in the fifth these stories lead in irish newspapers pushing domestic news off the front page it seems that when the reading public looks for excitement it looks abroad particularly to England and America. And yet, at home in Ireland, a quiet revolution is underway. Gone is de Valera's dream of a simple island people who speak an ancient Celtic tongue. Today's Irish are restless, anxious to take their place among the modern European nations. The monolithic structures of church and state, which have preserved the status quo for decades, are now under increasing pressure to change. Sean Lamas, a highly progressive statesman who embodies the new spirit of Ireland, has been Taoiseach since 1959. Under Lamas, Ireland's first programme for economic expansion, launched in 1958, has been pushed steadily forward. In the years up to 1963, more than 100 industrial plants have sprung up around the country, creating thousands of new jobs. Though the industrial sector is growing, a large part of the population is still engaged in subsistence farming. The smallest viable farm is considered to be 45 acres, yet there are over 200,000 farms of 30 acres and less. And living conditions are poor in rural areas. 90% of homes are without running water. 50% are without electricity. Predictably, there is a huge exodus from the countryside many taking advantage of the new opportunities in urban industry. The Catholic Church, too, is feeling the winds of change. There has been a significant decline in the number of Irish vocations. Tension is growing between the clergy and the more progressive politicians. New influences are abroad, influences which are largely beyond the control of the Church. Women are victims of a multifaceted sexism so blatant and so pervasive that it stands as an invisible backdrop to Irish society. Under the terms of the marriage bar, a married woman cannot be employed by the civil service, the local authority or most large companies. Furthermore, a single woman employed by one of these entities must quit her job if she does marry. Clearly, it is expected that women will seek fulfillment inside marriage and for the most part this expectation is not questioned. This, then, is Ireland, a small country, somewhat outside the mainstream of events, but determined, nonetheless, to make a place for itself in the modern world. One consequence of this drive for fuller integration in the global community is the desperate search by the Irish for international validation of any kind. John Fitzgerald Kennedy a man who has risen to the highest of stations and who openly acknowledges his Irish Catholic ancestry is therefore a potent figure. So when the 35th President of the United States arrived in Ireland on the 26th of June, 1963, the welcome he received was, at the same time, astonishing, 
and predictable. Mr. President, we welcome you to yourself as a distinguished scion of our race who has won first place amongst his countrymen, first in a hundred of a hundred and eighty, in a nation of a hundred and eighty millions of people. We are proud of you, Mr. President. We admire you for the leadership you are giving. We trust that under God's inspiration and with his help, you will be able to accomplish the aims which you have in mind, the aims of all who love mankind. Not only was it for the happiest days of President John F. Kennedy's life, but it was for the happiest days of mine. From that first arrival, at Dublin Airport and the greeting by De Valera, President De Valera and the Irish people, and then that long ride down O'Connell Street all the way to Phoenix Park. And I rode in the car behind the President with, uh, with our Secret Service and the Irish police. And you have a better idea of the welcome. 500,000 turned out to see their cousin from America and it was such a wonderful, wonderful greeting. And uh, I can remember the shops, everywhere you looked, you saw the American flag and the Irish flag uh, across like this, and a smiling picture of President Kennedy, and above it it read, Cade Miller Fawlty, and, and he fell in love with that. He worked it into some of his speeches. Well, it's 30 years ago, and I remember it very distinctly. I was then 32 years of age. I was the youngest member in the government. The last man on the team to uh, meet him, Sean Lamas, greet him, of course, and went right down through the whole row of ministers out at Dublin Airport. My first impact was of a man of extraordinary personality. The minute he shook hands with you, you knew you were in the presence of somebody who meant something. He had it, to use a phrase. I am deeply honoured to be your guest in the free parliament of a free island. If this nation had achieved its present political and economic stature a century or so ago, my great-grandfather might never have left New Ross. And I might, if fortunate, be sitting down there with you. <laughs> of course, if your own president had never left Brooklyn, he might be standing up here instead of me. The reaction all over the world to Kennedy, and more especially the, the, the culmination of his own instinctive power and strength when he overcame the terrifying, the really terrifying Cuban crisis with the Russians at the height of their power as well. All these factors um, made Kennedy um, a tremendous figure of, of almost superhuman and international world strength when he arrived, you're talking in terms of Alexander the Great, uh, Julius Caesar, now these may be exaggerations, but in a hundred or two hundred years time, uh, the significance will be realized. It's hard to understand now the semi-hysteria that was about at the time about him coming. He was the first American president to visit this country, I think, and uh, he was also Irish and Catholic, and I suppose every single man, woman and child had been rooting for him to, to, win, the, to win the election. Uh, I myself, I don't like that sort of thing, so I decided to get as far away from Dublin on, on, on the day of the visit as I could. So I, I took the boat to the Arden Islands, uh, which is as far away as I could afford to go. And um, while we were, it was, a, I remember it was a fine day because we were all up on deck on the boat, and some idiot had the had a radio with him, and we got the full belt of the of the speech. Everything I tried to be to avoid, I got anyway. But um, there was a lot of. Um, it was, I suppose it was a big day for Ireland when you when you when you consider it in retrospect. Um, it was a great honour, 
uh, there were a lot of little countries that he didn't go to. Um, so, you know, not to be too cranky about it, I suppose, a lot of the, the hoo-ha was justified, but I think we, we go overboard and that sort of thing. We certainly went overboard when he came to Ireland. I'm uh, glad to be here. It took 115 years to make this trip. and 6,000 miles, and three generations. But I'm uh, proud to be here, and I appreciate the warm welcome you've given to all of us. When uh, my great-grandfather left here to become a uh, Cooper in East Boston, he carried uh, nothing with him except two things, a strong religious faith, and a strong uh, desire for liberty. We went to New Ross, uh, which is in County Wexford, and uh, that is the place where uh, actually uh, Kennedy's great-grandfather had sailed to the United States about a hundred years earlier, and that was a very important place that John Kennedy was going to. And uh, we had a meeting with a man, I think his name was Minahan, uh, who was uh, the, the leader of the New Ross region, and uh, at one point, uh, he said, you know, we're not going to change this city. If this is an Irish city, we're, gonna, we're not going to change it. Well, I, I wasn't going to argue with him about that. But I noticed that about 25 yards away from where John Kennedy was going to speak at New Ross, there was a huge pile of dung. And so I said, well, do you mind moving the dung away? No, he says, that's Irish, Irish dung. It's going to stay there. And it did stay there. The only thing I remember about being in New Ross was that I was clambering up a scaffolding again in the midst of throngs and throngs of people uh, and the place going wild and he talked about uh, emigration and he talked about his family having left those shores to go to America and he identified very much indeed with the people down in that direction and then something went wrong with the microphones or the sound or something and I remember Andy Minahan uh, doing his celebrated oh we're all in prayer trouble now or words to that effect. I think it was in New Ross that I saw, I noticed something that was a feature of the Kennedy visit. And that's the, the local Irish politicians. All look so much older. Uh, they all belong to a quite different generation. They're older clothes and so on. And they were watching this young man with extraordinary intensity. Because they knew he had magic. They wanted to know what was the key. How could they discover how to turn people on? After speaking in New Ross, we took a motorcade to Dungetstown, and would you believe it? He's looking out and he said, Dave, see that fellow there? He's run all the way from New Ross, side by side. He said, we ought to take him back to America and put him in the marathon. And what enthused, that's, he was so, so enthused, he just wanted to reach out to every one of them. I had trouble keeping him on time, you know, we had a real, real tight schedule. And finally when we arrived at Ryan's, it was, you know, he just looked at that house where his great-grandfather, uh, Patrick, had lived in, you know, and they were stored, seemed to me they had green and things stored there now. And uh, he just wanted to know more about it. And, and he felt bad that he did not know more about the, 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 the history. And we went in and Mrs. Ryan had the tea and, and everything. But Cousin Jimmy handed him a, a, a shot of, with, of Irish whiskey. And he said, here cousin, this will make you feel better. Well, the president slipped it to me. And I had the job of downing it that early in the morning, you know. And uh, the president said, I had to give him back an empty glass. He said, I couldn't lose face among my cousins. <laughs> 
because uh, the president really wasn't a, a drinking man or, or he wasn't up to Irish whiskey that early in the morning. So I, I think at the rest of the day I felt a little groggy. There must have been four ounces in it, four ounces of Jameson. We felt that this, uh, the president was our cousin coming home to visit us because he was a, his dad and my father were third cousins and that had been proved by all, beyond all doubt. So he had came, come here in the 1940s and on his way up the road he met an old man inquiring the way. When he came back here 20 years later as president, the first man he asked for was that very same man. Probably in the meantime he had shook hands with probably millions of people and met, spoke to millions of people. And just to, to be able to think of that name after 20 years, was, I felt was something special in the man. He was reminiscing again about the trip to Ireland and telling us how really much he had liked it and when he went I think he didn't I think he had really no expectations I think he didn't know exactly what he would find or and you know as a lot of Irish Americans do um, the Irish America are very different from the Irish and if you grow up in a, a strongly Irish American world which, which Boston is certainly in other cities you do have a sense that that's Irish and then you go to Ireland and so many people have this same misconception and then they realize that it's not Ireland at all and, and it's very different in many, many ways. But anyway, and he, he realized that difference and felt it and did have a lovely time on that trip. And he was standing there um, laughing and he said, you know, everybody always is asking me what I'll do when I finish my eight years in the White House because I'll be too young a man to... Um, to retire and he said and now I know he said just before I leave I'm going to sign a piece of paper making myself appointing myself the American ambassador to Ireland in Ireland I think you see something of what is so great about the United States and I must say that in the United States through millions of your sons and daughters and cousins, 25 million, in fact, you see something of what is great about Ireland. We could hear from afar off, uh, over the loudspeakers, Kennedy arriving, his gradual procession from Wexford Park down to the Barry Memorial. And I remember uh, my first impression uh, of the cars, the, the motorcades sweeping in to Redmond Square uh, Kennedy standing upright in the uh, car, uh, waving to everybody in a marvellous exchange of, of goodwill and, should I say, happiness. But what startled me about Kennedy was that he, it almost appeared as if he had stepped out of a coloured television film. And by now, he is really worked up. And he's talking about... Ireland's chief export is not potatoes and linen, it's men and women who fought with heart and hand for liberty and justice all over this world. And he, he said, yesterday I visited that wall of shame. And that couldn't happen over here because you are the boys of Wexford who fought with heart and hand to burst in twain the galling chains and free your native land. They were wild. They're throwing hats up in the air and shouting, here, here, here. Because I said, my goodness, I hope Khrushchev isn't listening to this. I'm glad, therefore, that Ireland is moving in the mainstream of current world events. For I sincerely believe that your future is as promising as your past is proud. 
and that your destiny lies not as a peaceful island in a sea of troubles, but as a maker and a shaper of world peace. I think what people may have forgotten about that Kennedy visit was it was almost like a royal progression with a court and courtiers uh, and uh, a lot of fanfare helicopters flying all over the place. There was a huge air of excitement about it all. And, and that extended not just to the people of Ireland, but to the press of Ireland as well. Um, I think that we, were, uh, we didn't want to see any harm in anything that was going on. For instance, uh, before, uh, before Kennedy came here at all, uh, a group of press people were sent over from the White House and security people were sent over. And they were staying in the Intercontinental Hotel, what's now Jury's Hotel. And people were so hyped up about the whole thing, they were actually going up to have a look at the Secret Service men. In, in the Intercontinental Hotel, and some fella in a bar, in one of the bars in Jury's, uh, a bit few, a few jars on him, said to one of these Secret Service men, you know, you fellas are just the effing new Romans. The Secret Service man pulled his gun on this fella. Now, it's an indication of how much goodwill there was towards it, that that story never appeared in a single newspaper, not, not one. An incident in Ivy House on Stephen's Green, he was at a dinner given by the Minister for External Affairs about half past twelve at night. He came out. There were thousands of people at that time around Stephen's Green. They were actually in the green, up on the trees, lampposts, railings, you name it, on one another's shoulders. He came out, he stood on the steps and everyone started clapping. He completely ignored the security ran down the steps, over the cars, over the bonnet of a car actually, across the road and straight into the crowd of people. The people that were looking after him, the FBI and our own guards, were completely taken by surprise. It ended up where one particular guard on the motorbike had to turn into the crowd and try and surround them on his own to get the people away from him. Talking to the FBI, they were telling us the only thing they were worried about was the people were so friendly, they were clapping him on the back, shaking his hand, pulling and dragging at him, and they were terrified he'd be injured. Not purposely, accidentally, the people being so friendly. So Ireland is still old Ireland, but it's found a new mission in the 1960s, and that is to lead the free world, to join with other countries of the free world, to do in the 60s what Ireland did in the early part of this century, and indeed has done for the last 800 years, and that is associate intimately with independence and freedom. Just something I will never forget, really and truly, it was June, and it was, it was a beautiful day, really. And myself and my husband and my son and daughter, we set off down to the Grand Parade. That was the only place we could get a place, really. And um, it was very warm, the same day now. And I was pregnant at the time. And um, I'd always remember this woman gave me a seat, a little seat, you know, and I sat down. And... I thought really and truly he was beautiful. He really and truly, I thought it was something I never forgot really, I never will. You know, he was a beautiful man. And um, to see all the crowds with their stars and stripes, little flags, you know, they were selling them the same day in Cork. Cork was at a standstill really and truly, you know. I think every shop in Cork City and every factory in Cork City were closed the same day. And. Um, it was, it was really beautiful. It was a strange time. I sometimes wonder whether we would be as naive now as we were then, whether Kennedy or any American president would get the same sort of welcome. But in those days, we certainly thought, uh, here's this marvellous man, good-looking, lovely teeth, lots of hair, quick intellect, beautiful wife, lovely children, an Irishman and a Catholic, I mean, this is terribly important. And he could have been any of our cousins.
No larger nation did more to keep Christianity and Western culture alive in their darkest centuries. No larger nation did more to spark the cause of American independence and independence indeed around the world. And no larger nation has ever provided the world with more literary or artistic genius. This is an extraordinary country. George Bernard Shaw, speaking as an Irishman, summed up an approach to life. Other people, he said, see things and say why. But I dream things that never were, and I say why not. We were waiting for him to come down to this car, and we saw uh, my sister spotted Pierre Salinger, and she, his press secretary, and she said to go over and ask him for his autograph. So I went over to him and I said, uh, could, I, could you get me President Kennedy's autograph? And he said, get it yourself. I said, you must be joking, how could I go and ask him for his autograph? No, he said, go over and get it yourself. That uh, He's that type of man, he, he give it to you. He said, I have a paper and pencil ready, uh, or a pen ready, and uh, don't delay him. So I was waiting for him to come down, and when I got as far as the, his car, the Secret Service men, oh, they shoved me away, you know, eh? you know, I couldn't go near him. So he sat into the car, and I held up the, the, the notebook and the, the barrel, and he did this to me. So I handed it over to him, and he signed the autograph, and gave me a big smile, and handed it back to me, and drove away. So when he was gone, I was surrounded by photographers from all over the place and uh, journalists interviewing me and uh, uh, it was my only five minutes to fame that I'll ever have. For young people, it was an ideal, it was a vision that absolutely exhilarated them after the kind of bleakness that they would be used to. And this was only the beginning of young people finding an identity of their own uh, and he was actually the beginning of the, a youth culture, uh, that, you know, that was followed on by pop music, particularly by the Beatles and by that whole area. And his setting up the Peace Corps, for instance, was an acknowledgement of youth as well. His whole appeal during his presidential address, which was riveting, and the fact that this man used poetry, and particularly for Irish, Irish poetry, that he knew uh, philosophy and that he, uh, poetry was so different from our usual concept of the politicians, and particularly maybe Irish politicians at that stage, that we were absolutely bowled over. Uh, the day was clear enough and if you went down to the bay and you looked uh, west and your sight was good enough you, you, would, you would see Boston, Massachusetts <laughs> and if you did you'd see down working on the docks there Doherty's and Flaherty's and Ryan's and cousins of yours who have uh, gone to Boston and made good. I wonder if you could uh, perhaps uh, let me know how many of you here have a uh, relative in America who you'd admit to if you'd hold up your hand. He fell in love with Galway. Every day there was something that added more joy. In Galway, there's such a crowd that when the helicopters taken off, some of them actually went into the bay, the, the, you know, backing up, looking up in the wind of it, and he's going, look at down there. And they turned out all the boats, and, and uh, our Galway Bay never looked prettier. And uh, they put on a good show. They had the, the Irish dancers. And uh, we have a film of Ireland, and it shows the president tapping his, his foot to the Irish dancing.
So then we got into the car. He had his own fleet of cars, of course. And on the way to the square, uh, we passed my house and uh, I asked the president to wave to my mother who was standing at the gate and uh, he asked the chauffeur at once to stop the car. He got out, he shook hands with uh, my mother and of course all the neighbors had gathered and he shook hands with everyone and Actually, my nephew had foreseen that this might happen and he produced a book, an old book on the presidents of the U.S. and John F. Kennedy signed the book. United States, Ambassador Kearney, where is he? Right here, Professor. Stand up. He has sort of an elfish look about him, but he's very, very good. I said, what is this county noted for? And he said, uh, it's noted for its uh, beautiful women and its fast horses. Uh, I said, well, you say that about every county. But he, he said, no, this is true about this county. I uh, want to express my pleasure at seeing the Fitzgeralds. I wonder if they could stand up. One of them, one of them looks just like Grandpa. And that's a compliment. He was overwhelmed by the greeting. It was just uh, uh, from the time he stepped off that plane, it was, it was love at first sight. He fell in love with Ireland more and more after four days, and the Irish people fell in love with him. And the uh, thing is that he, we talked about riding home the plane, we talked about it that summer, out in the boat in July and August, relaxing, and. And, uh, you know, he, he says he wanted, Jackie didn't make the trip, and every time we're together, he said, D tell, tell Jackie more about Ireland, how the nuns were dancing on O'Connell Street, and about the wonderful Irish ladies holding up rosary beads and saying, God bless you, and the men with their children on their shoulders, you know? And it was such a, a proud day on it because he was one of theirs and, and he knew it and they knew it. Last night somebody sang a song which says uh, the word that which I'm sure you know which come back to Aaron in the morning in the morning come back to Rune to the land of thy birth come with the shamrock in the springtime of the morning this is not the land of my birth but it's the land uh, for which I hold the greatest affection and I certainly will come back in the springtime. He was one of their own. He was the President of the United States. Actually, you could say that the Irish people elected him president, and now he was going home to thank their cousins. And, uh, but, you know, it's the kind of a welcome you'd give a cousin, you know, just like uh, in the poem. Years of exile, years of pain. Oh, to see old Shannon's face again. Well, it, he's part of that. He was coming back to them, and they felt it. Because it wasn't just the young. He went up to the youngest and the oldest person in Ireland was proud of him. Here it is, the Shannon's brightly glancing stream, brightly gleaming. 
silent in the morning beam, oh, the sight entrancing. Thus returned from travels long, years of exile, years of pain, to see old Shannon's face again, oh, the water's glancing. Well, I'm uh, going to come back and see old Shannon's face again. And I'm taking, uh, as I go back to America, all of you with me. Thank you.